the proportion of men who are completely childless in any given generation is far higher than the proportion of women who are. So you, you see an element of expendability in males, and that's typical across the biological community because you don't need as many males as you need females in order to keep the population moving forward. Um, and one of the things that happens as a consequence of that, at least in principle, is that males are more behaviorally variable and variable across a lot of dimensions than females are, and that's a plus because they're more variable on the upside, but it's also a negative because they're more prevalent on the downside. So... Now, there's substantial argument about that in relationship to people, you know, what the actual implications are of that for human beings. Um, one potential implication is that although women and men have equivalent IQs, the standard deviation is slightly different, which means that there are more males who are intellectually impaired, but there are also more males who are four and five standard deviations above the population mean. You don't need much of a difference in, in standard deviation in order to produce radical differences at the extreme. So, for example, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Males are more aggressive than females among humans, but the effect is only about half a standard deviation. And so what that means is that if you take two females, a female and a male, randomly from a population, and you were trying to guess who was the more aggressive of the two, most of the time, you know, about 60% of the time, the male would be more aggressive than the female, but 40% of the time it would be reversed. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of overlap. But then, here's the rub. So let's say, just for example, that among the population of men and women combined, only the most aggressive person out of 100 ends up in jail. Those are all men. Because that tilt towards aggression is enough so that if you go way, way out on the distribution... The only people who are that extreme are men, even though the population difference isn't that great. So, anyways, there's a massive debate in the um, relevant literature about the potential consequences of that for things like cognitive function, because there's some indication as well that men are more cognitively specialized, but women are more cognitively robust. And so, anyways, it doesn't really matter. But what does, ma what does matter is the fact of this permanent dominance hierarchy. Now, the dominance hierarchy also has another, the male dominance hierarchy also has another feature. So we already said that, you know, on average, men are half as likely to leave offspring as women are. And so what that means is that all things considered, huh, this isn't, I'm not trying to make this into a, a circular argument, because I could say it's the more successful males that leave offspring, but then you'd say, well, that's a definition, Darwinian definition of success, but I'm not, I don't mean Darwinian success, because that's self-evident. What I mean is that if you look in the modern world, for example, and you try to predict number of available sexual partners for a given male, your best predictive measure of that is income, and the best predictive measure of that is intelligence and conscientiousness. And so, what happens is that males orient themselves in groups and then they compete and then women peel off the top and so and so the women are in a position of judgment on men and the judgment is the judgment of nature now from a darwinian perspective you know when we think of nature we think of like a friend it depends on who you are but like if you're an environmentalist you think of a french impressionist landscape you know forgetting that nature is also malarial mosquitoes and cancer and all those, and, you know, rats infected with bubonic plague and all those other lovely things. Um, but from a Darwinian perspective, you can define nature much more straightforwardly and more accurately as that which selects. Now, you know, you hear a lot about natural selection, and natural selection basically assumes that there are a random distribution of alterations in genetic structure in any in any population, in any generation, and some of those random alterations will be more suited to that particular environment, suited being they'll live and they'll reproduce, and genetic transformation takes place across the millennia as the organism chases the landscape. And what's interesting is that, you know, if you take 60 people, let's say if you took 60 women and you asked them, you showed them a bunch of men and you asked them to rank them in terms of their attractiveness, there's going to be fairly consistent rankings. 
You know, I mean, we know what makes up attractive facial features for women and for men. You, it's easy to determine that. What you do is you take 60 faces and you, you average the features. So you don't get the average person, because the average person is more like a median. You get the averaged person. And the average person has perfectly symmetrical features that are n nicely shaped and fairly big eyes and, and, and they're, they're, very, you know, they're very nice looking. They're very attractive. And so that means that there's like a central human form in a sense that we're, we find attractive. And we see this in other species. For example, there are butterflies who won't mate with another butterfly if it's, if it's like a sixteenth of an inch out of symmetry because then it's not a butterfly of that type. You know, and, and that's how people think, too, is the more you deviate from the averaged person, the less canonically human you appear, and the less attractive that you appear. And so, you know, we're chasing this ideal, in some sense, that's an emergent property of the nature of our species. And then, you know, there are certain physical characteristics, um, wide shoulders in men and narrow waist. In women, it's waist-to-hip ratio is a very common marker of beauty across cultures and across body types, interestingly enough. So if you take thin women and heavier women and you get men to rate the attractiveness of the women within that category, the heavy women and the light women who have a hip waist to hip ratio of about 0.68 are the ones that are judged most attractive physically. And so, and that actually correlates, by the way, with fertility because the abdominal fat in a young woman is a sign of ill health and also a marker of decreased likelihood of conception. Now, none of this is operating con consciously, obviously. It's, it's deeply wired into us. It's part of our immediate perception. But it still does indicate that there is an ideal, like a platonic ideal, lurking at the back of our minds against whom we compare everyone that we meet. And then you might say, well, what's the nature of that plat platonic ideal? And that's a very, very complicated question. You know, I would say that... I would say that you could, you could almost literally claim that the... Well, you can certainly claim that the ideal male is represented in mythology as a hero. So, and that's actually what mythology is about. It's about representing ideal patterns of behavior. So it's hardly surprising. And so, you know, if you go to a movie and it's a romance and there's the main lead character that you're supposed to fall in love with if you happen to be the kind of person that would fall in love with that kind of person, then he's going to act out a, partic a particular pattern of behavior. And the pattern of behavior is quite identifiable. So, for example, he's going to, be, he's going to move forward and explore and not hide and cower. And the probability that he's going to be creative is very high, and the probability that he's going to be good-looking and strong is very high. And so those are archetypal features. And those aren't all the archetypal features, because those are, in some sense, those are the, those are the self-evident ones. But, you know, people are also evaluating each other for such things as intelligence and personality and character. And you could say, in some sense, the men are competing to be the best man, and the women are watching the male competition to, to take the man who wins on the presupposition that he wouldn't win if he wasn't the best man. It's a very, very intelligent strategy, you know, because why not outsource the problem? You let the men sort it out. Well, it's too, cognitive, too cognitively complex to compute. You could say that the male dominance hierarchy is equivalent to the stock market. It's exactly equivalent to the stock market. It's the, like the stocks, are, stocks are always competing with one another and with every other commodity for primacy of price and value, and that's exactly what happens with male competition. So... One of the things that we've just discovered in my lab, this is Caitlin Burton's work, it's very cool. We took, uh, we were trying to understand the fundamental substructure of conservatism versus liberalism. We're, we're, and I'm going to speak in terms of conservatism because that's how, we, that's how we construed the data, although we could have done the reverse if we were going to construe liberalism. And what we did was we took, we got a bunch of people to sit down and write down statements they thought that conservatives versus liberals would disagree with. You know, I think we had, I don't remember how many statements, 300, something like that. And we had a lot of people generate them and take them from news items and so forth because we didn't want any bias in the, in the initial question set, you know. And, or we didn't want a bias that wasn't there in the actual world. So we had many people do this. And then we gave these questions 
to many, many people online in, in, in a variety of stages, and we, we extracted those out that seemed to best fit the data and, that were, and then assessed them for the utility in predicting things like party membership or voting behavior. And so we got a good structure. It makes a lot of sense. And what we found with regards to conservatism was um, there was an ethnocentrism factor. It was the third and weakest factor, and that would be associated with in-group preference versus out-group derogation. So those are anti-immigrant people, fundamentally, you know, and they're, they're well, they're ethnocentric. That's, that's, that's the simplest way to, that's the simplest way to explain it.